first of all, we all know that we treat our soils and our land as a non-living entity to be used and abused. And we have not understood that the land on which we walk is really a living entity. And there is a multitude of organisms which need to thrive to make a really healthy, fertile soil and environment. And we have our micro universe in the soils, which is bacteria, the algae, fungi, protozoa. And then you have the macro universe of insects, earthworms, nematodes, small vertebrates, and then you've got your little animals and your fish and your birds. And all of the above work in balance to create a living entity that we just call dirt. And in connection with the soil universe, we have the plant universe. And so these different worlds interact with each other in ways that I think we are only now beginning to understand. And this is a little quote that I've, from a book that I've been reading on the sort of a lot of the, the indigenous Australian sort of folklore and the, the stories. And I found it quite, quite pertinent to today's workshop. So spirituality to Aboriginal people is connected to country and is about relationships, spiritual relationships with the trees, the land, the animals, the sky and the water. Country is not viewed as a bit of dirt with economic value, but as a living entity. So the indigenous people here in Australia have known this for 40, 50,000 years. And I think we are only just beginning to catch up to what they have understood all along. So if we look at the, begin with the structure of the soils. And on a very basic basis, I'm no expert on this but it was just to give us some sort of um, idea of our soil and its many structures and many layers. And this is a whole science and topic all of its, in, of, it, of its own. And so it would change from place to place. We'd all have different layers um, in different parts of, of the country and different parts of the world, but the soil always seems to form in layers. So this brought a couple of questions to my mind is we know that the earth is a plasma, so it's giving and receiving magnetic fields. And do these layers have of the soil have different magnetic fields? Because if we compare it to the layers of our skin and uh, these then create magnetic fields as well in the interaction between the different layers. So is this interaction of the layers of the earth produce different magra fields that are coming out from, from the earth? And then we also have to start looking at, besides the different layers of the soils, you also have the underwater streams, under, underwater rivers, caverns, all of those in the, in the ground would be creating different magra fields at different points on, on, on earth. And then on even on larger scale, when they look at the real layers of, or that make up the whole earth itself, it's also layers and layers and layers of, of different rock that they've, um, that they've mined out and, and seen. And so these on a larger scale would also be creating different layers. And this brought another question to mind is when we look at uh, plants as well and different plants the, the roots of the plants will grow to different depths in the soil so some plants will have very surface roots some have tap roots that go quite deep and so one has to question now with the plants by growing the roots to different depths in the soils are the plants trying to reach different magra fields that they can interact with in the soils so this is part of the makeup of the plants as well so that they can get to these fields that they need in the soils in the different layers. And so when one has a look from uh, the larger earth to our soils, all have layers of interaction. And the interaction of these layers produce different magra fields at different points on the earth. 
So one has to ask what effect do these fields have on our plants, animals, and humans? And then it also brought into mind the, all the grid points on Earth as well that people have identified. And working with Klaus over the last couple of months as well, we begin to realize that everywhere we walk, there's a certain energy point um, on the Earth. So all of these are interacting with, with us, with the plants, with the animals. Um, so it becomes quite important to start looking at this interaction. Uh, from Earth itself. Okay, so that was looking at sort of the layers of, of the soils and the structure of, of the Earth and how that interacts. And then on a very basic level, when we look at the compositions of our soils, it's um, obviously air, water, 25% air, 25% mineral particles 45 and then organic matter 5% which is made up of organisms, roots and, and humus. And humus is essentially the, the dark organic matter that forms in the soil when plants and animal matter decay. So that's your really top layers where you're getting all the uh, old plant growth and animals that sort of die and fall and decompose into the soils. And then when I look at the mineral particles, obviously we go from very large gigantic rocks and then we come down to uh, what we call uh, classified as gravel, sand, silt, clay, which comes down to uh, 0 0.002 millimeters with that classifies as, as, as clay. So we have different sizes uh, in our our soils. Now just looking at the organic matter at first, um, so this consists of material from dead plants and animals and then in that matter we basically have a wide range of, of starches, proteins, sugars, carbohydrates and amino acids from the plants and the animals that are decomposing. And then these start to break down into molecules and then into the individual elements where we're left with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. And then the minerals as well from the plants and animals um, are left in a gain state after the breakdown as well. And all these are broken down by the soil microorganisms, which are bacteria and fungi. And uh, humus is, as I said, is the humic substances left at the end of the breakdown of the plant and animal matter. So that's essentially what's going on in, in the organic matter. And this is just a bit of a graph showing the, from your soil organic matter, and then you get your humic substances, which then break down, and we get what we commonly known as, as, which they do sell in the shops, as the humic acid and the fulvic acid, which is just the liquid which they take off from the decomposing of the organic substances. And obviously, as it decomposes further and further, we lose more nitrogen, we lose more carbon uh, on that basis. So that's just showing you where we get our humic acid and our fulvic acid from and why it is uh, so effective. So then we look at the minerals and the humic acid helps to make the minerals and elements more available to the plants. And at the, in the last couple of years or so, um, particularly what I've come across is with the soil, there's a big talk on the minerals that are available in the ground and the minerals that are not available in the ground. So it's the minerals that the plant can't take up or absorb as we've understood in the past. And a lot of tests are done on people's farms so that they're able to distinguish how much iron they have, which is available to the plants, and how much iron they have, which is essentially locked up in the soil. It's there, but it's not available in a form that the plants can use. So there's a lot of research going on in this particular area. And we now understand that the plants only take up the fields. 
So, which led me to look at now, we've got to try and look at this distinction as to why some of the minerals that have been available to the plants and some not, but when they're only taking up the fields and not the actual material. So, my understanding then, if we look at the minerals in the ground, in the soils, that is what they would call non-available, I can equate to the same as if we put a piece of iron um, in direct contact with a plant, it will have no effect on that plant. Um, the plant will not be able to interact with the iron. It's in a matter state and the magra fields are not very strong. And so I think when they're talking of the non-available minerals, it's in this sort of matter state form. And when we look at something that is available to the plants, I'm thinking I've just gone through this process, is if we have a look at the iron in the soil, in all, uh, and how this will be, be beneficial to the plants. So first of all, how do we make the iron nanoparticles? That's essentially rust. And that happens when we expose the iron to water and oxygen in the soils. So if we put a piece of iron into the soil, it's going to start rusting because of the exposure to the water and oxygen. And these that rust will become nanoparticles in the ground. And now these nanoparticles in the ground will also start interacting with the salt environments in the soils, which leads to the creation of the gains of iron. And so now I'm thinking now that the plants, we have that gains of iron in the, in the soil, and now the plants can interact with the fields from the gains of the iron. All right, so besides that, I've sort of looked at another avenue where we can uh, make the minerals available as well, is when we look at the, the earthworms, the insects, and all those little, little critters, um, they all break down the vegetation and uh, the rocks into the nanomaterials of the different plants and the minerals. And as an example, when we look at just the earthworms, um, they use tiny, tiny little rocks in their stomachs to grind up the vegetation that they eat because they don't have the teeth. So it's this grinding of the rocks together uh, must also create nanoparticles of the different elements from the rock. And then these essentially become the nanoparticles are again turned into the GAN state with the interaction with the, the soil, the salts in the soil, being it, whether it's sodium, potassium or calcium salts. And there again, we have then the different GANSes of the different minerals in the soils, and now the plants can start interacting with these fields. So to me, this is another way of how all the little creatures are doing their little bit to make this available minerals available to the plants. So another, another way to look at it as well is we know that the soils around the roots of the plants are, are teeming with life and each plant type seems to have a symbiotic relationship with certain bacteria and fungi that are attracted to those type of plants. And so we have an interaction around the zoo, the, the plant zone, the, with the root zone, where plants exude sugars for fungi and bacteria. And as the fungi and bacteria are amino acid based, do they provide these amino acid magra fields for the plants to interact with? So can the plants take the fields of the amino acid without having to create them internally? So that was just another question that came to mind as well. Is that the plants can do this, but is that amino acid strength the right strength that the plants need? It's another question for scientists down the road. So my conclusion is a uh, question then, is plant available minerals in a GAN state and unavailable minerals in the matter state, you know, that seems to be the logical conclusion. But that's, that's to me what, what the thinking should be and, and probably a lot of research should go into it. Um, it's to make sense how 
that's the distinguish between the two. Okay, so my next step would be looking at the biology in the soils. And a spoon of healthy soil contains more living organisms than all the people on earth. So we might not see them, but uh, there's a huge living world there. And in the soils we have the bacteria world, the fungi world, the insect world, nematode world, protozoa world, and the earthworm world, and there's many, many more because within each one of these, the bacteria, there's hundreds of thousands of different varieties and fungi. And so one would need years and years of research just to go into each one of these topics. Uh, but they all come together, they all work together in a very symbiotic relationship with each other. Obviously, your research has led you to, to look at that bit of bacteria in the bottom left-hand corner. He looks like that, doesn't he? <laughs> that particular one does, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. That's a Jimmy bacteria. <laughs> it just doesn't move. I couldn't find one that moves. <laughs> and I think so. We also have to understand that these different organisms, you know, your bacteria, your earthworms and your fungi uh, also have a magra field. They're living organisms, so they will also have their own little magra fields and will be interacting with each other. And these living entities in the soil would also have a soul, they'd also have we see the physicality, they would have an emotion and they would have a soul as well. So now when we look at, we can add the picture of sort of the bacteria because we've looked at the, the earth and the plants and the sun, but the bacteria is exactly the same. So it's just the scale that changes, but otherwise we're all the same. Because when one looks at uh, the bacteria and they amino acid based, because when you look at a breakdown, obviously it's a very general breakdown. Some bacteria would be slightly different, but essentially it's 50% carbon, 22% oxygen, 12% nitrogen, 9% hydrogen. So there's already over 90% is just made up of the four basic elements of the cohans. And as we've explained beforehand, the bacteria, which are all amino acid based, live in balance with the roots of the plants. And as I opened up the question before, is are the plants absorbing the amino acid magra fields from all the different fungi and bacteria in the soil? And are the plants in turn providing food for the fungi and bacteria in the form of sugar, the CH3, so which they would be using the hydrogen as their fuel and leaving the carbon in the soil. And each plant type and root structure would attract different fungi and bacteria in the soil. And this is one I put together. I was trying to understand from a plasma point of view what was really happening in our aquaponic system because when we have the fish and uh, they produce ammonia, which was NH4. And looking at that from, from a fish point of view is, is the, the poop that would come out is, is ammonia. And how, I was thinking now, how would that ammonia be transferred into the um, bacteria? Because we had you get two types of bacteria that convert the ammonia into nitrites and then into the nitrates. And I was just looking at that from sort of a field transfer because if you take uh, ammonia NH4 being, being quite an acidic uh, 
acidic and have a fuel strength of 18. And you've got a bacteria, which we know is uh, COH and N, which is in of a higher field strength. So all you're doing is you're having a field transfer of sort of hydrogens or nitrogens coming across from the ammonia into the bacteria and so on and so on. So one really has to look at these whole chemical processes and are they really chemical processes or is it just a case of the field transfer happening between one and the other uh, from a different field strength point of view and one slightly acidic, one slightly uh, neutral to alkaline being in the bacteria. So you get this field transfer going on and then again with the roots. So it was just, uh, I just toying with the idea of, of trying to really understand what was happening in our system uh, from a plasma point of view. So you know, here again, it's just a lot of research would need to be done and re looking at the whole uh, chemical world and the chemi way chemical reactions really take place, particularly in the natural world, where we've got the ammonia from the fish and bacteria in, in our waters. And it would be the same, exactly the same in the soils when you have your, your roots and plants and animals decomposing generally into you get your ammonia and that's decomposing into nitrites, nitrates, ex exactly the same into the, in, in the soils. So it's another whole avenue to uh, research, I think. And then it comes back to our graph where we had originally looked at and discovering the, the soul of the man and the plant, where we had understood that if we look at the, the man first, his blood is iron, physicality being copper, a fuel strength of 63, our emotion of 65, and then our soul strength of iodine being 129. And uh, we had discovered that the, the plant, its blood is magnesium, its physicality is silicon, its emotion is sulfur, and its soul strength is zinc. And that's why we have such a close connection to the plants, uh, because our emotion is feeding the soul strength of the plant, and their soul strength is feeding our emotion. And that's why we have such a, a great interaction with plants but as everything is all scaled up and scaled down, um, I did, we, we did have a look at, at what the fungi and bacteria would be. So looking at their same principles, their blood, their physicality, emotion, and soul. And I was applying the same principle where the, the soul strength of your bacteria and fungi would be on the same level as the emotional strength of the plant. And so I've got a big question mark here because nothing has been confirmed, Mr. Kish. Um, we never went down this road. It was just something I put together. But it's just something that we can toy because there is a, there is a sequence between all of us, so you know, between us and the plants. So why can't there be something further between the plants and the fungi or bacteria or the insects? And again, from the man, there's obviously something higher, which uh, is feeding off us, us or we're feeding them. So it's all a step-by-step -step process. So it has another area which needs to be discovered to find out, you know, how we can sort of also connect to the world that lives beneath our feet. And so we, when we look at this picture again, it, it brings a different perspective because we have the plant world in combination with the soil world and are the fields from the plants feeding the organisms in the soil and, and vice versa, just like between ourselves, the man and the plants. So it would be the same between the plants and all the organisms in, in the soils. The never ending cycle of the field transfer, because that's essentially what everything is all about. So when one looks at the decay of organic material, 
uh, when it decays, it means it's losing its plasma structure in a sense. The fields of the apple can no longer hold together, so it starts losing these fields to the environment. And the games breaks down to just the individual fields of certain strengths. It breaks down into the carbons, hydrogens, and nitrogens. And these magrav fields might be in the right strength for the bacteria or other organisms in the soil to interact. And so what I'm just trying to illustrate here is that the fields we know from the universe, uh, the weaker fields will make up uh, galaxies and those weaker fields will make up solar systems and then our sun and earth. And so it's the weaker and weaker fields. So these decaying fields from the fruits and from the plants, they will then have foods. These provide the energy and the fields for the bacteria and so on. So it's just the cycle and cycle of, of the changing of the fields from one form to another. And unhealthy plants will have a certain magra field that is matching with a certain bug that is attracted to that plant as well. And here's quite a nice little, little quote again. Um, this, the tree, and I'll just read it. Um, the tree, he watching you, you look at tree. He listens to you. He got no finger. He can't speak. But that leaf, he pumping, growing. Growing in the night while you are sleeping. You dream something. Trees and grass, same thing. They grow with your body, with your feeling. If you feel sore, headache or sore body, that means somebody killing tree or grass. You feel because your body in that tree or earth. Nobody can tell you, you've got to feel it yourself. I just thought that's such a great way to explain our connectedness to nature and how we have to sort of get back to that connection with nature and how the indigenous people around the world knew this and that's the way they've been living all this time and so we've seen this picture many times but it, it brings it into perspective again is that we are all one nothing is separate and everything is connected and we're just beginning to sort of understand how connected we are with everything around us. Which brings us to our call for peace over the last couple of weeks. And I was thinking about it the other day and we as sort of the human beings are, th are sort of thinking arrogantly again about calling for peace on earth, thinking we're the only ones that really matter. But what if we called on the billions of insects, the birds, animals, trees, our grasses, earthworms, bacteria, fungi, our rivers, and oceans, and land? They all have a soul, which collectively with us humans make up the soul of earth. So we need to reconnect with earth and all its creatures. And if we can do that, can you imagine us all working together in cooperation to bring about peace? And if we could do this, peace would be done right now. So it's a case of having to call on and work with all these creatures around us uh, to bring about peace on Earth, and not just us as human beings. Mm -hmm.